Every generation has events that shape who they are. The greatest generation defeated fascism in World War II. The silent generation was defined by ambiguity in the Forgotten War. Baby boomers had Woodstock. And Generation Xers had the introduction of personal technology. But it is the millennials who could be the next great generation. Join 10 Penn State students as they discover what it means to be this generation. We are the millennials. So obviously we know that we're called the millennials. What I think would be a really interesting, just something to show would be what other people call us because everybody has different ideas of what our generation is. So I think it'd be really interesting to go out and ask other people what they think our generation's called. That's a good idea because we have a, like you could call it the millennials, but you could also generation, what is it, generation Y, I generation, mm -hmm. me generation, that's all different kind of things. And like, a millennial generation isn't very descriptive of our generation, it's more of a time period, I think. So yeah. some, maybe something we could find something that's more descriptive of us. What would I name the generation? I would name our generation as indecision. I think we are a very rebellious generation. We're such an instant gratification generation. I don't know. I don't know what I'd name it. I think we'd, we just like to keep moving fast. I think um, this generation is just probably very fast-paced. Our generation is loosely defined by uniqueness. I don't even know what we could name our generation. Generation confused. Uh. I'd say we're like technology oriented. Technology generation. Because we're all growing up with technology and like my parents don't really understand computers and stuff, but I do. Just because everything we do revolves around technology. Facebook because it kind of like controls everyone's life. Oh my god, that's a hard question. <laughs> Our generation is tough to characterize, especially in one sentence. I think a huge problem for our generation could be uh, debt, especially from student loans, because, I mean, tuition's on the rise. Like, every year it rises, like, 3 or 4%, and the maximum grants from the federal government's only, like, $5,000. Just here in Penn State, if you're, even if you're in state, it's still twelve thousand dollars, and it's like over twenty if you're from out of state. So I think that's definitely an issue that we should explore because it's going to be a big problem for our generation. I think. I'm getting about sixteen thousand loans a year, and by the time I can actually pay that, I think everything will cost double. So, like forty thousand dollars in debt. A couple hundred thousand, probably, maybe a hundred, hundred fifty thousand. I will have a significant amount of debt. I'll have to take out some loans after this first year. I loans through like FAFSA and through some of the scholarships here at the college. I figure like everyone else has debt, everyone else has been doing it for years, so like they've all gotten through it. Most people I've talked to right, haven't had problems making that up with loans and hopefully making enough money to pay it off eventually. With the cost of education becoming more and more expensive, many students leave college with an exorbitant amount of debt. About 15 years ago, the average student debt was under $10,000. Now, it's over double that amount. Penn State student Angeline Horner is a typical college student. With the amount she owes from student debt, she expects to be $50,000 in the red upon graduation. I try not to think about it sometimes, but it's kind of in the back of my mind, like what if I don't get a good enough job or something? How am I gonna pay for it? But like many students, Horner wants to enjoy her time at college and focus more on her education. I'm kind of just living the college life. Like I don't try to be frugal now. Like I do save some money, but I just want to deal with it when I graduate, not worry about it now when I'm in college. I try to focus on school. For now, Horner works 20 hours a week at the family clothesline. I use it for saving money, to help me save money, and also just to have extra cash. Even though Horner doesn't have to worry about her loans now, she realizes that she will be paying off her loans for a long time. I know it'll probably take some time, maybe like, I know some, my one family member still paying hers off. Many students haven't even considered how long paying off their loans will take. Dr. Jack Raymond, director of Penn State Career Services, says that paying off debt is not something to be underestimated. 
most people, I think, underestimate how long it's going to take to pay off debt. So, you know, from my perspective, I don't think that it's, it's good to think it will be easy. Raymond explains how students should manage the reality of their financial situations. The best advice I have is try to keep your debt to a minimum. Um, don't think it'll be easy to pay off. And while Raymond acknowledges that student loans can lead to serious debt, he believes that a college education is a sound investment. We know that college graduates earn more than high school graduates, a substantial amount more in terms of their life earnings. Angeline, like many millennials, has to balance the benefits of higher education with the financial burden of college. Coming up after the break, we'll take a look at how popular websites may cause you to lose your chance at the job of your dreams. That's next on We Are the Millennials. True or false, the birth rate among women aged 15 to 19 has gone up since 1972. This special presentation of the Big Ten Network has been brought to you by the Penn State College of Communications and Penn State Public Broadcasting. True or false, the birth rate among women aged 15 to 19 has gone up since 1972. False. Since 1972, the birth rate among women aged 15 to 19 has gone down from 61.7% to 41.6% in 2003. One thing that was really interesting, because we are so connected with, with technology, and you even had something that you thought would be a good idea. Yeah, obviously with technology, it seems like everybody nowadays is connected. Everybody wants to get in on this new social networking craze. It's just mm -hmm. taking over our lives. Like Everybody has a Facebook account, a MySpace account. Um, but what I think a lot of people don't realize is the inherent dangers that come with having these accounts, having your personal information out there for everybody to see. And now more than ever, a lot of employers are looking at these things. I think that's something definitely we should at least investigate. It's no secret that our generation is responsible for pioneering the social networking craze. But what began as a hobby for most has quickly become a necessary part of life. The two most popular social networking sites, MySpace and Facebook, boast an incredible 230 million plus members many of which come from the millennial generation. Um, Facebook I got freshman year. I do use Facebook. Tried um, MySpace out. Uh, sadly, I'm part of Facebook. I, I, I actually got yelled at when I deactivated my account for a bit. That's what the world's coming to. So. Yeah. With over 8.5 million photos uploaded to Facebook each day, the site has definitely replaced the traditional photo albums of our parents' time. However, unlike those photo albums, we may not be able to control who sees the pictures that we put online. Once it's online, it's online. Anybody can do whatever they want to your picture, so that's basically why I made it, just for my friends. I, I think there's like an option that you can record a photo if someone else puts one up of you and you don't like it, but I don't really think anyone takes it that seriously. But At least I, we don't. Yeah, maybe I, employers, and I should start worrying about that, but I'm not <laughs> really right now. Actually, employers have been using these sites to get a better look at who their future employees are outside of the workplace. Penn State's Director of Career Services for the College of Communications, Bob Martin, says that we should be more mindful of what we share on these sites. I recommend that if you've got things on that site that you think could be uh, even remotely considered uh, as a negative, get it off there. Martin, who assists thousands of students with getting jobs, says employers will seek any information they can get on potential employees. I think that recruiters are always trying to look for information. They're looking to make sure that, that you're a strong investment. And if they can find uh, a way to get more information uh, that can secure that investment, assure them, affirm them that that investment is strong, recruiters are going to do it. Some of the students we spoke with claim they don't browse these websites too often, while others admitted to checking them more than once a day. 
but when asked whether or not they would delete their accounts after they graduate, everybody shared the same response. I can't really see myself erasing it just because I don't really have any need to. I think I'll probably keep them just because it's a good way to keep in contact with friends. Do you imagine like all the things that we would like have said if we didn't have a delete key or like a <laughs> send key? Like, yeah. Yeah, anytime, like, even if you tried to go to Google.com and spell it, you could wind up at, like, Goggles.com. Yeah. <laughs> you, you would just have to I've deal with that. it. <laughs> I remember in grade school, like, wasn't there part of the writing process was actually to pre-write where you'd actually, like, sit down with a piece of paper and write down all your ideas before? I, I don't think I ever did that. I kind of, I feel like we're part of, like, the delete generation in the sense that we can say what we want over texting or email or even just writing a paper. But when it comes to, like, physically writing something down, it's a lot more permanent when you write it down. You know, a quick little couple clips of us just talking to people, figuring out, you know, if, if that really is the case or is it maybe just me. If there was no deleter backspace, then, um. That's a good question. I'd probably have to write everything out on paper first before I type. Because, uh, I mean, it would be really bad if you put something that you didn't want to put and then you couldn't take it back. I would definitely take a lot more time to think about what I was going to say. I um, have a lot of problems correcting my papers. What? Nothing could be erased. Nothing could... Keep typing anyway and just write things like, oh yeah, I didn't mean to say that. I probably want to send a lot of emails. I'd probably have to start over. I couldn't get back. Um, I just have to be really careful about what I type, I guess. It would probably put a big damper on my communication with other people. That would be rough. That would be really rough. I don't know. It's really interesting to think about it. True or false, the percentage of teen drug use has fallen since 1980. True or false, the percentage of teen drug use has fallen since 1980. True, since 1980, the percentage of teen drug use has fallen from 53.1% to 36.5%. My biggest fear is getting a job that I absolutely hate. <laughs> Probably just getting old in general. My biggest fear is Failure, I guess. Falling flat on my face and having everyone point their finger at me and saying, I told you you'd never make it. Or... Biggest fear is probably getting a job that I hate. My biggest fear, that, uh, that I'll get locked into a job that I'm not happy with just because it's a job. I'm being able to live comfortably and having enough money to support me and any loved ones that I might have in the future. Biggest fear is doing what I want to do, not what I'm expected to do. Not knowing what I want to do. So I went to the career fair a few weeks ago and I spoke to a bunch of job recruiters and a bunch of people that are going into the workforce. And people that are going into the workforce assume that they're going to get a job. I think they don't realize that there's so much more mm -hmm. to it than just like graduating and getting your dream job. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people in our generation just kind of in the back of their heads assume it goes from college to degree to like dream job, just like that. Mm -hmm. Like there's no middle ground, there's no in between, no waiting, mm -hmm. and it's obviously not true. One of the biggest questions our generation fears is, what are you going to do when you graduate? While many students know what they want to do for their future career, some don't realize how long obtaining that dream job could actually take. David Pensick, editorial director for the Barish Group, and a Generation Xer, believes that the millennials don't see the first job as a stepping stone. It isn't just the first job, and they, they want to get the experience and they move on. They know that uh, they're a part of this instead of just looking for themselves, they're looking to be part of a team. But unlike previous generations, many millennials don't feel attached to their jobs and are always looking for better opportunities. In a survey done by PricewaterhouseCoopers, students said the one thing they wanted most out of their first job was a good reference for their future career. After graduating, Pensick, like many millennials, had a desire to be treated like everyone else in the workplace. When I came in, I knew it was a good team atmosphere, 
So I figured I was going to be equal. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't threatening anyone. They weren't going to threaten me or whatever. So I think, I think that's what was what I was expecting. You know? I think that our employers expect um, good communication skills and a hard worker and um, somebody who's dedicated to what they're doing. Just you know, good work ethic. You know, put the time in, and you know, everything will be all right. Um, dedication, definitely. Dedication, honesty, <laughs> and like really being upfront with them and like trying my hardest. I think they expect me to be there early, willing to stay late, and to be overly ambitious and willing to do any task at hand to get ahead. Velma Shu, an editorial and ad assistant at the Barish Group, and a recent graduate, believes we are a more driven generation than the ones before us. So we're a lot more hardworking these days, and I think in a way we try to, we have a way of trying to prove ourselves. One thing is for certain, no generation can anticipate what the future holds. What percentage of millennials are accepting of interracial dating? Is the answer A, 12%, B, 20%, C, 53%, or D, 82%? This special presentation of the Big Ten Network has been brought to you by the Penn State College of Communications and Penn State Public Broadcasting. What percentage of millennials are accepting of interracial dating? The answer is D. 82% of millennials are accepting of interracial dating. One thing that I think that's interesting that we haven't talked about yet is future environmental concerns. I mean, especially right now with uh, Inconvenient Truth and all the, all the stuff that's coming out right now about the global warming and environmental problems. I think that's a really big issue because if we don't do something about it, that's going to be a crisis. And I think that it's time that we start thinking about more than just little surface changes like turning off your lights. I think we need to start adopting more policies towards these things. And that's what our generation is not only going to be voting for, but it's going to be our generation that's in political office when those things are happening. So that might be like a defining moment in our generation, I think. Could be our legacy is, yeah. is figuring out what to do about these problems. The millennial generation may seem to be focused solely on themselves. They're preparing for jobs and at the same time trying to get more and more friends on MySpace. But this generation is also thinking ahead for future generations. I assisted a professor in Greenland studying global warming and ecology. So I just went out there um, having no experience, but just as from a scientific standpoint, we spent about a month and a half and tracked how climate change was affecting the ecosystem. With programs like the one that Reese took through college and with the hype that Al Gore has created through movies like An Inconvenient Truth, it's hard for young Americans to say they've never heard of global warming. But it's one thing to have heard about an issue and another thing to take action against it. Reese points out that economics may have a lot to do with why some millennials are finding it hard to help. For people who can afford it, it's great. It's like, yeah, oh, I can spend the extra money and buy that light bulb or drive a car, but um, there's just so many millions of people who can't. And that's, that's, what, that's the issue for me. It's like, I don't feel right just advocating, oh, we have to do A, B, C, and D, and then things will work out. It's like, I'd rather us all like turn inside and, and find a way to do it together. Students at Penn State did just that. The Eco Action Club organized a dodgeball game to raise awareness and money for soil erosion. Brittany Harris agrees with Reese and says that it's important for students to work together for a cause and put selfishness aside. That's the mindset that's killing us. If everyone thinks, okay, I make a change and this person makes a change and that person, that's three people right there and that adds up. And we've, I've had that mindset in the past um, and thought, am I really making a difference at all? But then I've, I've kind of got to witness the, that difference at Penn State. Um, we started out with just a couple hundred letters signed by students saying that they wanted uh, clean energy on campus and eventually all these petitions added up and we actually got the university to change. But with millennials always on the move and constantly connected, there are small things we can do to reduce our impact on the environment. Using fluorescent light bulbs, driving less and recycling more will reduce the amount of carbon dioxide used. 
And with all of our technology that we seem to be addicted to, things like turning off our televisions, DVD players, and computers when they're not in use will also make an impact. Even simply planting a tree will help absorb one ton of carbon dioxide during its lifetime. I think that living my lifestyle and, and being a part of a community of my friends who are doing the same things and um, choosing my career path is the first step I can take. So as we're busy planning for our futures, it's evident that we're not just looking out for ourselves. Over the past several months, we have learned many different things about this generation, and even more about ourselves. It doesn't matter that we can't decide on our name. We're focused on other things. We're working hard to secure that first job and hopefully prevent debt. We're thinking about things we can do now to prevent environmental problems from happening in the future. And through it all, the driving force behind what shapes our lives and consequently our future is technology. We don't know exactly what the future holds, but we do know it is the events that happen during our lifetime and the way that we respond that will shape how this generation will be remembered, just like the others that have come before us. We are the Millennials. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.